Hello everyone. On behalf of HLB Hamt, I would like to welcome you all to this live event. My name is Valerine Suarez and I'm a corporate executive assistant with HLB Hamt. This webinar is aimed uh, to provide important highlights of the introduction of corporate tax in the UAE, uh, which would be effective from the next financial year. Uh, you know, on or after the 1st of June 2023. Now, considering that tax is no longer a new topic in the UAE, and since the last three to four years, the government has made uh, various announcements about different rules and regulations, which are mandatory for various sectors and industries. They have issued uh, some frequently asked questions, which clarify most of the basic queries related to this topic. So in order to answer these questions, we have a great panel on board, which comprises of our chairman, our tax and audit partners, and a transfer pricing expert, and other members of our staff. So this session is gonna be an interactive panel discussion uh, with a variety of practical uh, questions and answers, which is related to this topic. At the end of the webinar, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, so we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. If you miss any questions, we will send you can send your answers to us. Sorry, we will reply back to you to you all via email. So uh, thank you everyone again for joining us on this panel discussion. My name is Raghunath. I'm handling uh, the internal audit and consulting uh, businesses at HLB Hemp. And uh, I'm moderating this uh, panel, which uh, has a uh, of some eminent uh, experts in the area of uh, taxation. And I will introduce them to you and uh, we will uh, get to know them better and uh, as we go along. So to start with, uh, we always talk about taxation as something which is new. Okay, now to put things in perspective and probably to surprise a few of us, including myself when I first saw it, uh, there is uh, taxation in the GCC is not new. So if you see this timeline up on your screen, it has started in 1950. Saudi Arabia was the first to introduce personal income, capital gains, and corporate taxes. It was introduced on both nationals and non-nationals. Uh, within six months in the same year itself, Saudi Arabia retracted the tax on the nationals. And uh, follow, it was then followed by Kuwait. Kuwait started the tax, uh, corporate tax in 1955. And UAE introduced certain taxes in the mid 1960s. So I'll touch upon that later. Some of you might already probably know what these are. Oman uh, moved into the tax regime in the 1970s. And uh, this was also followed by Qatar subsequently. And UAE has uh, in 22 has announced that the taxes will be effective. Corporate tax of 9% starting from 2023. So just to bring us all on page, you know, we all know that uh, there's nothing certain in life except death and taxes. So taxes are here, a background, just to say that this is nothing new for all of us. So uh, moving on, uh, what kind of taxes were there in the UAE prior to 31st January 2022? For upstream oil companies, uh, uh, there is, has always been an emirate level tax uh, imposed. So upstream oil company is any oil company which is into extraction not the refining, which is the downstream part. Since uh, precious natural resources are being used, the government has decided to had uh, always decided to have a tax on these. It was about 55% of the taxable income. There is a 20% tax rate applicable on branches of foreign banks. So these were always in force. However, uh, the one of the backbones of UAE's economic success has always been the free zones, the free economic zone. They have provided tax exemptions on holidays for periods between 15 and 50 years. Uh, we will touch upon uh, corporate tax and the possible implications of corporate taxes on free zones uh, as we go along in the panel. So that uh, is where we are as far as the UAE is concerned. The good thing, of course, is that corporate taxes, if you look at it, uh, we are still at the right side of uh, the list of names here, the smallest at 9%, as against Saudi Arabia, which is 20%, and uh, the other GCC countries, uh, some of the other GCC countries are in between. So even at 9%, which would start in 2023, UAE would still be the lowest taxed uh, country in the GCC. Why corporate tax? Of course, uh, some of our panelists would probably cover this, but uh, the basic reasons are, uh, there is a requirement to be a global team player as put forth by the OECD. 
uh, the OECD is the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. So this, uh, again, more on this uh, later on by one of our panelists. To, def uh, to fund the deficit created due to uh, lowering oil revenues, we know that uh, oil prices have been going lower, have also been fluctuation, uh, under fluctuation for the last many years. So there is definitely going to be that. The plus, of course, there is a, a, there is a clear uh, trend of uh, economies, including the GCC, going towards uh, non-oil resources in the interest of environment and sustainability. So there is going to be a requirement for the government to have uh, taxation, alternate sources of revenue. Then there is, of course, the international pressure on tax transparency and preventing uh, harmful tax practices, uh, which exists uh, right now across uh, so many jurisdictions in the world. The UAE's diversification strategy, which I mentioned earlier, because uh, to move away from non-oil to other sources. Providing world-class infrastructure and better standard of living, that is one good thing we have seen in the UAE. I'm sure all of us here who have been living here for long enough uh, can, I can appreciate it, that uh, taxes are used for improving the standards of living and infrastructure. It has been uh, one of the themes of the UAE's uh, economy for the last uh, several years. And of course, to fund public spending. All of these are uh, very uh, good usage of ta ta corporate taxes. And uh, like I said, this will also be touched upon by our panelists as we go along. So now uh, for us uh, as businesses in the UAE, what is the way forward? The, the, we would actually categorize it from our perspective into four stages. The number one stage is impact assessment. Now we all want to know for everybody's business, uh, what would be the impact of corporate tax? How is it going to impact our business? So the assessment of the impact is very critical. Uh, the nuances of this will of course be explained, uh, would be clearer as the rules and the legislations come along. And uh, we would also try to address parts of it uh, I think Mr. Sumesh, who's in charge of our audit and accounting, would also be part, uh, would be able to help us in that area. Uh, then planning and designing your internal systems processes to go into the tax regime. Implementation, that's uh, how are we going to implement our processes and how the actual tax filing and the tax related day to day activities are going to get implemented. Uh, this will also include the, the transition from your non tax to the tax uh, system. Also stabilization and ongoing. So basically that is going to be the final step where basically once uh, the organization gets set into the tax environment and what are the ongoing activities which are accompanying uh, the corporate tax regime. And uh, as we go, we would like to, you know, press on one particular thing because in this, uh, at this stage of uh, the legislation, this is very, very early days. So the views that our panelists are expressing are completely based on their assessment, their expertise, and uh, in light of the legislations that have been announced as on date. So we would like you to consider that uh, these are guidances and uh, things might move in uh, alternate directions as we move forward. But we believe that we have done our best to look at international practices and also uh, look at the legislations and make views on how we should all prepare ourselves for the regime going forward. I'd like to move on here on this. So uh, I think uh, I would now uh, ask maybe in this uh, panel, I would like to start off with uh, Mr. Hisham. If uh, you're ready. Yes. Yeah, so Mr. Hisham, uh, just uh, would like to start off with you. Uh, so UAE, uh, you, of course, since we're introducing corporate tax next year, now, could you just brief uh, as to what do you think would be, in your view, would be the possible reasons to introduce corporate tax? We did touch upon it, I, mean, I know, in the introduction, but uh, in your own views, if you could tell us something about the introduction and the reasons. Yes, uh, thanks, Sergio, for giving me the floor. And um, uh, I would like uh, to welcome everybody. Good evening. And it's really an honor and pleasure to be with you. With you. Um, as you mentioned, that uh, with effect of, from the financial year starting from June 1st, uh, about uh, corporate tax. Here we have to be uh, precise as we uh, know that uh, more than 95% uh, of uh, companies are having their financial year 
uh, from uh, January 1st until uh, December uh, 31st. Uh, accordingly, uh, they will practically apl applicable uh, for them uh, January 24th, which means that the first uh, return uh, would be due in uh, the year 2025. Uh, we also have uh, companies attached or uh, linked uh, with other countries like India, UK. Uh, usually, they uh, follow uh, first uh, uh, April until the 31st March. Uh, they will begin April uh, 2024. Uh, companies related yeah. to countries like Australia are also following uh, yeah. July, uh, June financial year. Uh, they will start just on time as uh, low imposed. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's upon uh, companies and their policies in regard of uh, their financial year and up to regulators for uh, public uh, companies. And somebody, any company, uh, for any company in UAE, for the uh, if the financial year is July 23 uh, to June uh, uh, 24, then the corporate tax will be applicable uh, this year. Tax uh, return after uh, July of uh, next year. For uh, the other part of uh, the question, whether I didn't, yes. I think, um, uh, about uh, whether the possible reason of introduction uh, corporate tax uh, yes. for uh, the government uh, perspective, uh, that imposing uh, corporate tax uh, uh, main objectives are cementing the UAE uh, position as a world uh, leading uh, hub for business and investment. Uh, in addition of meeting the international uh, standard for uh, tax uh, transparency and preventing uh, harmful tax practices. Also, it will be uh, accelerating the UAE's development and transformation to achieve uh, its strategic uh, objectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. So, uh, just I think I would like to, uh, you know, probably move on to the next uh, question if you're done, Mr. Vishwam. Is uh, this, I would like to address this to Mr. Sumesh, uh, because one of the things that we always, we have been seeing is that uh, the current understanding is that corporate tax is applicable on earnings above $100,000, that is 375,000 dirhams. Now, we know that there are so many smaller companies in the UAE whose profits are far lesser than this. Uh, so, what is the procedure for such companies? Are they required to register? And uh, you know, what uh, do you understand? What is the current understanding? Yes, sir. thank you, Rego. Um, yes, definitely. All the companies who is practicing their business in the mainland and free zone should be registered for the tax if their income is more than uh, 375 or less. Okay. Yeah. And um, the less. Uh, amount less than the net income of 375 means that they have a zero percent rate tax and above means 10 percent rate tax and the most of the world's taxable regimes having a challenging um, part in this sme business sectors because it is mainly composed of the sole establishment partnership and service entities especially if you look onto the small grocery shops saloons restaurants bakeries okay and accessory shops, they are going to face little challenges on the transition. And also no. now you know that there is a freelance license in the mainland of Dubai. They are allowing to do business of the freelancers. So they, they are also coming under this scenario. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, even your net revenue is less than 375,000, they need to file the tax return. And they need to comply all the regulations that the keeping of the books of accounts, maintaining proper records, documents, everything needs to fall under this. And okay. there, there may be some clarity will be required. Probably we assume that the, once the law and regulation is coming, uh, it should be clear, particularly the tax effect on the Emirati owned companies. And mm -hmm. some, some uh, GCC jurisdiction itself, they allow some capital limits also. If certain uh, capital is not maintained by an entity, probably they will not fall into the taxation category. They are exempted. We are not sure about what would be the current situation going to be here. Okay. And uh, the clarity related to the audited financial statements also not yet clear at the moment, because usually in the tax jurisdictions, audited financials is a mandatory thing along with the uh, tax uh, returns mm -hmm. and 
whether a registered tax practitioner needs to be a there for the tax filing or not that also we are not clear probably it's a self declaration at the beginning that's what i assume that and concerning to the books of account it might be mandatory to keep the books of account as per the double entry system because when you you're coming to the tax scenario you need to ensure that your books of accounts are kept in a proper order as per the international standards and as far as the entities are registered in vat they are required to maintain the proper books of accounts that we already seen uh, once the vat regime is came into this bit again based on the current information we can expect that all the entities should register for the corporate tax and they need to file a return whether it is a 0% or a 5% okay that's what my point okay. of view okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mesh. That uh, helps a lot. Uh, Mr. Carlos, uh, could I move over to you, Mr. Carlos? Uh, Mr. Carlos, I think. Uh, uh, so we just wanted to understand uh, from your perspective, uh, from the international perspective, we talk about something called transfer pricing for corporate tax, right? Now that is your bread and butter. That's the area which you're specialized in. So we just wanted to get your idea that about uh, we understand that uh, you know transfer pricing guidelines are going to be applicable, and uh, to many of us in the UAE this is still a new concept. Uh, most businesses here do not really have never really need added to the need to think of this. So could you just explain in a much in simple terms what is transfer pricing and what is it? What are the guidelines at an international level? And uh, this is something which is uh, actually Greek and Latin to most people in the UAE, at least uh, the normal I mean, people who are not in your domain. So we would just like to know a little bit more about uh, transfer pricing, what it is, what is the OECD guideline for transfer pricing, which is what is universally. You could just throw some light on that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to HLB Hyman. Uh, I am very pleased as uh, the head of uh, transfer pricing globally for HLB to be invited to this event, uh, which is an introductory one. And to begin with, what is a transfer pricing? Transfer pricing is what we call a legal economical fiction. Legal economical fiction that supplements the taxable base, the taxable base of the taxpayers in a fashion that goes beyond accounting. This okay. means that uh, according to your post legislation, your taxable base is going to be the accounting result plus minus some adjustments. And one of those adjustments will be an incremental of your uh, taxable base based upon the arms length principle, which is uh, okay. the fiction of the fact that related companies are normally uh, trading or rendering services to each other or providing financing to each other yes. in a fashion that might be not in alignment with a uh, non unrelated. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we understood uh, the first point of what you mentioned. Uh, now, um, continuing on uh, transfer pricing, uh, what happens to uh, this transfer pricing guidelines? In your experience, are these normally applicable only for international transactions or local transactions between related parties? Do they also come under the purview of transfer pricing guidelines? The uh, transfer pricing per se is a fiction of economics beyond the accounting and beyond the financial approach of the relationships between related parties. Okay. According to this economical fiction, mm -hmm. the taxable base will be adjusted in okay. uh, conjunction with the accounting result. Mm -hmm. According to your uh, post legislation, the taxable base will be your accounting results plus minus some adjustments and the adjustment uh, that refers to transfer pricing will be guided by the OECD guidelines yeah. okay. that are forced in fact ever since 1995 and 
those had been amended ever since several times from uh, PEPS, which is the base of the property shifting program of the OECD. And uh, this is just getting the uh, flavor of including elements of economics into the, the tax tax. Okay. 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 Uh, Mr. Jackson has uh, been uh, in the tax uh, area with us with HLB Hampton. He's ever since the introduction of VAT and uh, the subsequent uh, taxes which have come in. Uh, now, one thing of interest to all of us, especially people in, in Dubai and even in the other parts of the UAE now, is about free zones. Right now, we know that free zone companies are exempted from UAE taxes. Uh, the free zone authorities themselves have assured of you know 15 to 50 years of uh, uh, you know tax-free regime. But what do you think, in your opinion, will this continue for corporate taxes as well? What is your expectation on this? And uh, that is one part. Uh, secondly, there are there are mainland companies in the UAE. They have a lot of exports from the mainland. So, what about profits from these exports? Now, are these going to be taxed? What is your view on these? Okay, thank you, Radhu. Good evening, all. Uh, the question on uh, free zones are you know very frequently asked as and and the ministry has announced it in in three four segments separately in the uh, announcement okay. see we all know free zones in uae are generally tax free in in majority of the free zones are putting the advertisement in the website and various documents that you know they are tax free starting from 15 years it could go up to 50 years they announce it as if it's a tax holiday until okay. that period but the announcement from Ministry of Finance on corporate taxes says that free zone companies are subject to taxes. Mm -hmm. So that is the terminology they used. So what does it mean? When the ministry say free zone companies are subject to tax, taxes and the tax rates announced are varying starting from 0% to 9%, I assume mm -hmm. that all the free zone company would be subject to taxes with okay. certain conditions. Conditions, the, 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 the ministry has already given some indications on that. You know, mm -hmm. one of the conditions are that they should not conduct any, any local business. As long okay. as you conduct local business in UAE, mm -hmm. of course, it should be subject to local taxes. Okay. But if you conduct only international operations, then you would be falling under zero percentage, which means okay. you have to register for corporate taxes. You have to file the returns. Okay. As uh, Mr. Sumesh was mentioning, zero percentage is also a tax rate. Okay. And accordingly, all the compliances, all the documentation, bookkeeping methodology, everything you have to comply. Only thing mm -hmm. that the tax rates are zero percentage. Okay. The, the, the problem is, mm -hmm. we all know that in UAE, in, in free zones, you know, many companies are doing mixed transactions. Like we do international, we do local. Mm -hmm. So how do we calculate the taxes in such scenario? That is a question mark. Okay. If you do local transaction, if you do international transaction, that is not very clear in the announcement. I feel that there would be a methodology from the ministry in the executive regulation to compute the taxes on local transactions separately, international transactions separately. Probably international transactions are zero percentage, local transactions are subject to nine percentage. Then the methodology of computation has to come from ministry. As of now, that is my guess on that because they mentioned that you know local transactions are subject to taxes. Okay. Okay. And uh, coming to the second part of that question from Mr. Ragu. We all know like, uh, you know, mainland can conduct local operations. Mainland companies can operate international transactions. Mm -hmm. okay. In the mainland, there is no exemption announcement. Mainland companies are subject to corporate taxes straight away. Okay. Free zone company, there are two brackets, zero percentage and uh, nine percentage. So mm -hmm. probably there could be a, a, some mechanism that, you know, companies has to rethink on redomiciling okay. from free zone to the mainland in one, one segment or it could be vice versa from mainland to the free zone. It depends on the transaction. Say I, I will put one, one example on that. Mm -hmm. Like Roku was mentioning, if you conduct a, an international export business from mainland, yes, and you park the profit in the mainland company, yes, it is taxable at the moment as per the announcement. Okay. But the same transaction, same business, if you shift to a free zone company, since it's falling under zero percentage, mm -hmm. on international taxation, you might get exemption. Not exemption, I would say, it's zero percentage. So okay. if you have a substantial profit parking on in, in local markets mm -hmm. from international transactions, probably 
those re-domiciling has to, uh, you know, we have to plan on those those re-domiciling. But, you know, what is, uh, I mean, to what extent we need to think about the re-domiciling, it all depends on the, the quantum of the profit you're parking in your company. Mm. And of course, moving from Brazil to the mainland, because of mm. the many incentive provided by the ministry in the mainland now, without 100% ownership in the mainland, you know, freelance license in the mainland, etc. So, you know, due to that, mainland is getting more attractive from free zone, and of course, it's more less expensive in the in the free zone. So, movement from both sides, like movement from mainland to the free zone or free zone to the mainland, uh, both directions might happen because of this corporate tax introduction. But you know, mm -hmm. we have to have a clear plan on that. Once the executive regulations has come, we will work on that. We can advise more on that. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, just uh, if I may follow through with one more uh, short question. Um, there are entities uh, under the same VAT group, which are controlled by the same management. You know, there are entities which operate in both mainland and free zone. Uh, so uh, would that, uh, what would be the impact uh, in such cases? What What is your view on that? Uh, yeah, see, this is a good question. Uh, we you know VAT, uh, VAT law permits, you know, forming a tax group. We we technically call it as a physical unity, fiscal okay. unity. Fiscal unity meaning comprising of, you know, certain companies under the same management or or and you know with the the guideline issued by the VAT authority, they have given some permission to group certain companies into one tax group. Okay. If it's a one tax group, we are supposed to file and comply in 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 one account. That okay. a TRN number will be same. Uh, through this uh, corporate tax announcement from Ministry, they have clearly mentioned that forming a physical unity for corporate tax purpose is up to the client. You are permitted okay. to do that, but it's not mandatory as well. Once okay. we form that, you know, once we apply and get the approval from Ministry on forming a group, we uh, the the single tax return. We need to file only the single tax return, and and, and the advantage would be more on exemptions or exclusions from you know. Uh, taxations or transaction accounting between the intra group or inter group transactions. So once okay. that is done, that those transactions would be out of scope for, for the, mm -hmm. the purpose. And uh, but again, forming a group for corporate tax purpose is not mandatory. Say mm -hmm. initially, Sumesh was hinting 375,000 is the threshold limit they have announced for the base tax value. Yeah, I mean the base profit value. If you have three or four for entities in UAE operating, you know, if you wanted to make it like 375 or less in every entity, you are permitted to do that because they have okay. told already it's not mandatory. Okay. So forming okay. a group is mm -hmm. always a better idea for complaints purpose. Okay. You know, you need to comply in one books or one one mm -hmm. one office or in one one uh, TRN number that would be more easier than, you know, making com complaints in every company. Okay. The compliance process will be easier if you form a tax group. The same VAT tax grouping the same. will be okay. uh, implemented for the corporate tax as well. But we have to apply separately for this purpose. That is the only thing. Okay, okay. But the principles of grouping would remain the same. That is correct, okay. correct. Maybe I would have to probably go back to Mr. Sumesh to clarify this. Uh, I mean, from an accounting and, uh, you know, IFRS uh, point of view, what uh, kind of, what are the adjustments that, uh, you know, we talk about typically. Could you please elaborate a little bit more about the kind of adjustments that we need to consider? Yes, yes. Yes, basically, um, uh, everybody feels that the net profit means the uh, reported uh, f uh, net results of the IFRS financial statement. But usually, all the world, there is a, a change on the uh, reported profit to the taxable profit, tax net income. So there are certain kind of disallowed expenses, which are mainly if you see the GCC scenario, uh, I'll consider few few exemptions which we uh, already seen in Qatar perspective as well as KSA. The non-deductible expenses usually may come in UE also. This kind of donations probably oh, the donations are not eligible for the uh, as an expenses, probably with a cap. And there may be fines and penalties which you pay to the governmental entities or a statutory bodies that also disallow. Then business promotion expenses probably with a cap. Usually they adopt a cap like say, turnover a two percentage or maybe a net a net income one percentage something like that. They will come 
but usually the business promotion expenses, especially the entertainment, hotel, restaurant, gifts, commissions, commissions to agents, all this will be coming as a non deductible category, but we are not sure what level of caps we are going to get here. And the other point is that owners remunerations, especially uh, including their family members, currently the shareholder salary remunerations, all are vatable kind of expenses. Currently it is vatable, but uh, probably I'm not sure how, how the other people are uh, taking it. So there is already a regulation on that. So coming to the tax scenario, this also will be an alerting point for the management of the company. And probably the board of directors remuneration, then depreciation rates adjustments probably, then the management services, service charges from the headquarters to related companies, as Mr. Carlos mentioned, it is coming under the transfer pricing scenario. But this is also, we seen that probably they will allow some cap to charge the management services and disallow the majority of the expenses yes, these, properly. These yeah. adjustments, uh, that are uh, required by the transfer pricing guidelines are adjustments that normally lead us to think first of an adjustment in price. Mm -hmm. And what we need is to compare what would be the uh, charges that intercompany uh, transactions will take into account if non related uh, links would be in place. Therefore, what the analysis of transfer pricing pretends is to avoid yeah. the consequences of having uh, related parties influence in either terms, conditions, or prices. And the analysis, instead of being just a price analysis, is the analysis of the differences between assets incorporated, functions given, and risk burn, burn by the parties. And this is an analysis that will bench, be benched market according to international databases. And there is a lot of work to be done as long as your legislation is going to be forced from next year onwards on a tax plan, because the yeah. transfer pricing is not only a uh, compliance uh, matter, but it's also an instrument for an alignment of the value chain. And this alignment of value chain will be allowing the companies to minimize their, their tax burden, although your tax rate is a uh, single tax. Okay, yeah, understand, uh, Carlos. So the um, usually the GCC scenario, especially when you look at your UAE post tax scenario, there are a lot of related pretty transactions are involved in all the companies. So this is one of the key area. Probably all the management needs to look into that. Apart from that, personal expenses of the owners or the uh, key management personnel also will be a disallowable expenses. We are not sure at the moment. So as a result, if you feel that if you see that the company's uh, FRS financial statements giving you a loss figure and you may feel that you are not uh, falling into the tax category, but once you adjusted all these kind of expenses, probably your profit will be a taxable profit. So this is an alarming point. So people who are not familiar with the tax regime will be very careful on the non-deductible expenses. That's it, Diego. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. The, there is uh, cases, I mean, uh, amongst the practice we have on a worldwide basis that uh, the financial result is negative. I mean, you have losses, and with the adjustments of transfer pricing, you become uh, subject to tax because of the adjustment in itself. And that is something that might take taxpayers in as a surprise. And this surprise uh, is always uh, avoidable if we do a good tax planning with the alignment of a, a benchmark of what the uh, related parties transactions shall be taken into account. It doesn't refer only to those uh, transactions that are being priced accordingly to the financial uh, guidance, but also there are certain tolerances of either use of a trademark or the use of knowledge, the use of within, with no cost, 
that will have no accounting entries at all will have to be incremental in the uh, taxable base based upon the uh, guidance of these three pillars assets incorporated, risks assumes, and uh, the functions that are. Uh, Carlos, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can I, uh, because Raghu was trying to ask you a question earlier about transfer pricing. Is it applicable on local transactions and international transactions or both? Yes, normally, normally. The transfer pricing uh, adjustments are applicable to both local and international accounts, but the focus of the OECD guidelines is on international profit shifting. Yet the legislation as it's changed will be applicable to local uh, transactions as well. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Uh, so just to continue on one point uh, which we touched upon uh, again, I think probably I'll have to go back to Sumesh on this. Uh, there is a transition period, right? We are changing from a non tax to a tax uh, environment. So what kind of preparations should businesses have to go leading up to 2023? Because if you're talking about adjustments and all of those things, you know what kind of preparations would you expect? Would you recommend to any business? go into that case. Yeah, um, yes. Rego, uh, yeah. can you hear me right? Rego? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. See, basically uh, the first thing itself, the people's mindset needs to change because we, we had a, a free a flow of transactions here. So that that the changing mindset itself is the one of the challenge which you, you adopt from the throughout the organization. That is one thing. So mainly if you categorize overall how you need to approach as an organization, the, there is a three particular area which we need to focus. Basically one is technical part, the other one is operational part and the third one is people part. OK, so the technical part when you look into that as you your slide itself is saying that the impact assessment which you need to properly conduct. The impact assessment can be done in housely or with the help of consultant or auditors, but the manager needs to make sure that whoever is involved in all this impact assessment process should have sufficient knowledge on international taxation issues and double taxation. So they should have a sound knowledge on that, then they can do a proper impact assessment. So if you do a proper impact assessment, majority of your job is done. Then when you come into the structure and system, you need to look into your legal structures. Probably you have branch companies, you have free zone companies, and you have mainland companies, and you do invoicing across these companies, and some company you have expenses only on the man manpower, and some company only have the tendering purpose. So how all this could be structured? Then mm -hmm. you need to look into the contracts review, especially your related party that is coming on the transfer pricing and the other stakeholders, what are the elements you need to restructure. Then the compliance review, whether you keep the documents properly and all the uh, uh, documents are available and which is connected with the accounting system. So because uh, the fines and other uh, penalties coming to the tax region will be very heavy and which will delay and disrupt your business operations also to some extent. So you should be very careful from the beginning itself. And you need to make sure that proper traceability of transactions are there in your accounting system. So if your accounting system are outdated, probably you need to start with the correct accounting system. Then probably your financial statement, you need to look into the financial statement, whether your financial statements are fully complied with IFRS or other, 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 other acceptable standards. Basically, as per the federal law, it is insisting IFRS itself. Then data storage and retrieval. Then your classification of transactions. So what are the classes of transactions you deal with? Especially when that regime is came, you have a, a kind of <coughs> different category on revenue. But going forward, you may look into the expense category of transactions also. Mm -hmm. Then probably this is affecting your pricing decisions with the customers. Your product or service pricing also will affect once the <coughs> tax is coming to the picture. Because if you mainly deal with the free zone companies, mainland companies, all this will be diluting your pricing. Then probably you need to look on the reconciliation of your revenue with the VAT and other components in the accounts. Then coming to the people scenario, 
the, your in-house people should have a minimum level of knowledge, especially on the transaction level. And they should have a proper knowledge on IFRS. So if this two is blended, then probably you will have a smooth journey. Then there may be another impact related to the people that is especially for the remuneration part, as I already discussed that the financial and operating impact on the top key manager people. So the directors, shareholders, how their remunerations are structured and what all their expenses are coming. These are all will be very, very critically evaluated and adjusted and also should be consistent. The accounting we are talking about 2025 return and 2024 financial year. Now we are on 2022. So overall your financial statement should be consistently presented over these years. So that, that is an ideal situation where you need to start all your preparations right now itself. Because this is what I feel that every company needs to focus. We have to start acting now. Yeah. Right. Of mind. OK, OK. Uh, so uh, just uh, I would like to move on to the next question for Mr. Hisham. Uh, some of the things, but before that, I just wanted to make a general announcement. Uh, we are, uh, Girish, I think we can open for Q&A. We have a live uh, Q&A box because I'm sure uh, there must be a lot of questions which people must have come up by now. So we would like to open the Q&A. You can uh, enter your questions into the chat box and uh, we will try and answer as many of them as possible given that we are already you know, well stretched, but we will try, try. If not, uh, there is a mail ID which will be shared with you and uh, you can always mail it to the ta tax at hindbiham.com mail ID and you will definitely get a response. So uh, coming back, Mr. Hisham, uh, I mean, there is a lot of uh, you know speculation about what happens post tax. How is life going to be? How, what is going to be the impact on UAE after corporate tax uh, comes in? So what in your opinion, could you just please give some insights on what is going to, how is it going to uh, uh, impact the economy? That's something which is very close to everybody's heart. Uh, so Hisham, you're muted. Could you please unmute? Sorry, Rigo, and um, okay. yeah, thank you for your, for your question. Um, yes. As you know, like um, the corporate tax is like a new guest coming to our uh, UAE economy at the aggregate legal level. So there are uh, things that we know theoretically and do expect while uh, looking at other countries' experiences. Uh, so when we say uh, guess, it means that we need uh, to take care of him as, yes. uh, as per our tradition. Uh, when he arrives, we are going to know more about him. We need to prepare our, uh, uh, we need to prepare for our guest with the best practices <laughs> of our capabilities uh, yes. to avoid non-compliance and unnecessary uh, penalties. Um, yes. So back uh, to the question, how it's uh, going to affect uh, the UAE economy, in my uh, humble opinion, and uh, as uh, we are uh, awaiting for more guidelines uh, through, an, uh, I mean, a decree law and executive uh, regulations, uh, in addition to what uh, I have mentioned uh, earlier, it uh, will be, uh, I believe it will be boosting uh, revenue or base for uh, government as expected, uh, tax uh, as expected tax uh, collections uh, per year, about uh, three, uh, 35 billion dirham, apart from other tax, uh, tax schemes. Uh, yes. But in return, uh, it will uh, lead uh, to provide uh, high quality uh, services in all sectors, higher standards of uh, living and uh, developed uh, infrastructure. Uh, other uh, advantage could enhance the transparency in investment sectors through its controversial matter, uh, but it uh, might attract more uh, foreign uh, direct investment. Um, also, since uh, tax rate uh, is fixed at uh, low level, uh, we don't expect substantial impact on overall economy in UAE, but uh, we may witness uh, a, mar a marginal uh, hike in uh, product pricing and eventually uh, the inflation uh, rates as companies may recover such uh, direct taxes uh, through a hike in uh, product prices. Uh, prices. And uh, also it will uh, boost uh, the growth of business activities uh, positively. Uh, 
Um, are you listening to me? Yes, yes, yes. I yeah. think you've answered. <laughs> yeah, and uh, apart from uh, what I have mentioned also, uh, shifting uh, of uh, zero tax regime into a uh, tax regime, uh, according to some of corporate uh, may rework on uh, structuring their uh, ownership base in UAE. And uh, the final thing that I want to uh, say in this uh, time, uh, one of the things that to be mentioned, the corporate uh, tax uh, should motivate uh, companies uh, to increase its operational expenses rather than lowering cost to increase profit to avoid uh, paying uh, more taxes that might lead to increase uh, that might, uh, I mean, uh, lowering the, I mean, uh, sorry, like uh, uh, increasing the uh, operational expenses, it will lead to increased companies' efficiency and positively affect the economy. That's interesting, Mr. Hassan. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Uh, I'd just like to go back to Mr. Carlos for one thing. Uh, now, when we talk about uh, transfer pricing, now we in the UAE, we have uh, so many entities that are uh, importing and exporting from many countries. I mean, UAE has been a trade hub for many, many years, okay, and it has been one of our uh, USPs, so, so to speak. Uh, now, people always want to know, once you get into this regime, do you foresee any uh, certification requirements? Uh, you know, especially when you have countries which have parent companies somewhere else in the globe, OK, so from a transfer pricing perspective, what kind of documentation requirements are uh, required uh, when uh, countries operate like this? So from your experience, what could you suggest tell us? Relationship, the relationship yes. between the uh, importation and the transfer pricing is a totally direct relationship okay. and it has an impact the imports and exports as well, and okay. it might have then income tax uh, consequences as well as consequences. Uh, I think I lost the audio for a bit here. Uh, I think I lost the audio for that last bit. Sorry, Carlos, could you repeat that? Yes. The transfer pricing matters are applicable to both the customs okay. and okay. the uh, corporate income tax. So any okay. uh, international trade, both import export, is going to be affected on the taxable base for okay. duties and for corporate income tax. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That that makes it clear. Um, I think I'll probably. Uh, one more question I wanted to ask Mr. JK. Again, uh, this is to do with, uh, uh, again, uh, companies uh, and associates about share holdings. Now, we, there is something, uh, there is one question about, uh, you know, companies holding shares both in UAE and outside and getting dividends. So now are uh, companies required to pay taxes uh, for profits from dividends? Currently, what is the understanding? Yeah, FAQ has already given a clarification on that. FAQ point number 22-23 talks about income okay. exemption, exemption on income from dividend and capital gain. Yeah, okay. uh, it's clarified that the the dividend and capital gain from earned by any any UAE operating company from qualifying okay. shares, okay. Yeah, from a qualifying shares would be exempt. It is not okay. uh, to be included in the income for taxation purpose. Okay. So, other than qualifying shares, it is taxable. So, dividend okay. or capital gain from a qualifying shares are exempted. Having said that, what is the meaning of qualifying shares are, you know, up to an ounce? Mm -hmm. We have not seen the definition for qualifying shares in, in, the, in the regulations. But what the indication has given through the FAQ was qualifying shares means about ownership interest in a company that fulfills certain conditions. Okay. So probably, you know, that would be a conditional uh, kind of clauses, which would be either a percentage of shareholding in the other company, or it could be any okay. other parameter, which as per the executive regulations they announce. But once that is done, that uh, qualification or qualifying equity, uh, qualifying shares are there, and then if you earn income from capital gain or dividend, that would be exempt. So generally I understand, or I feel that these are going to be exempt. Okay. okay. Thank you, thank you. 